what was it you were trying to do in films of the 70s that the films of the 40s didn't? How are you trying to do it differently at the same well, time? Well, that, that's, that's, that's two different answers to that. The first thing is that, I mean, my whole fascination with Hollywood films go, goes way back. So that in films like Mean Streets, for example, Mean Streets is very much in the tradition of the gangster film of Underworld and uh, uh, Scarface, uh, Public Enemy, and um, the Roaring Twenties. Mainly Public Enemy are in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, because I only saw Underworld recently, a couple of years ago. And Scarface, we never got to see in America because the, the, title, the, the rights were held up until Hughes died. And then now we're able to see it, but I saw it about 10 years ago for the first time, uh, several years after I made uh, uh, Mean Streets. But what I mean in the tradition, what I mean by being in the tradition of the, uh, of the gangster film is, that, is the inspiration. The inspiration is very much in pictures like Public Enemy and uh, uh, Roaring Twenties. That's why I was very pleased. Lord, um, that, that, that's why Mean Streets not worthy to eat your flesh. deals with um, not that level to your blood. of uh, small-time hoods. And everything. Uh, but I was very pleased when Warner Brothers bought it because it was in the tradition of the Warner Brothers gangster pictures. Yes. It was an homage, in a sense, to the Warner Brothers gangster pictures. But um, the main the main reason for it, of course, was it was my own uh, semi-autobiographical film. So uh, it just happened to fall into place with. If anything, what genre? Yes. The gangster genre. Right. And what was the best gangster genre? Warner Brothers. Sure. They always had, you know. Um, and um, uh, uh, New York, New York, on the other hand, by the time I got to do New York, New York, it was three years later. And I was so fascinated with uh, Hollywood films, especially the 40s. Uh, being born, I was born in 42, so my first memories of films of the 40s, and uh, vivid memories, because I remember going to the theater and seeing them uh, vividly in uh, Three Strip Technicolor. Yeah. Uh, the, the women's lips were so bright red that, you know, they just leap out at you and uh, the flowers and uh, the musicals, Nancy Goes to Rio. I mean, that was a big sure. one for me, as you know. So, <laughs> hey, no fool around there. Yeah, that, I'm right. great. Nancy Goes to Rio, wonderful picture, right? I was watching it, it was, it was on t TV the other morning, again, TNT, Turner Station, again, he has it on. Beautiful new uh, uh, master, right. video master. But in any event, um, uh, uh, New York, New York was an attempt at a, a very, very serious homage to the style of filmmaking of the 40s into the late 40s and at the very end of the picture the early 50s 52 before cinemascope right. it was very 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 specific and i just they gave so much to me i wanted to i wanted to recreate one last time something that looked like that um we painted all the sets i mean we made all the sets i got boris levin i met boris levin through urban winkler uh, he was a, a designer i admired so much after seeing giant and the silver chalice two films that were, were pivotal to me uh and i was fascinated by meeting him I said, you are one of these people from the old time who knows how these sets were made and what they did. The scale of the set, even. Um, uh, and he, he agreed, and he agreed to do it. The problem was that in 70, 76, when we made the film, those sets were no longer, in other words, you had to build every set. There were no, I thought, I was very naive. I thought some of these things were existing. For even the, uh, the railroad, the um, getting off the train sequences sure. on the, the railroad station, uh, I thought that would exist on the MGM lot, you know, the beginning of the bandwagon. I'll go my way by myself, right? Well, we went there. It's a complete dis disaster. It was all torn away and uh, ripped away, and uh, I think they even use it in that's entertainment. They do. They're, they're ripped. The show yeah, they show it. And that's what it was. So we couldn't use it. So we had to go. We had to actually go to an actual uh, station and build some things around it. But the idea had to be that it had to be New York, New York, shot completely in Los Angeles, because when I was a kid and we saw films that took place in New York, especially musicals uh, and gangster films, um, not necessarily Public Enemy, but I mean pictures like Side Street with uh, no Side Street was shot a lot in New York. Actually, but, uh, it was yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, different uh, different films uh, uh, by Ralph Walsh and, and uh, MGM films. Sure. Um, you'd see that the curb in the street was, was like, very high, yes. very high, and was very clean. And that's obviously not New York. And somehow um, the back lot, even though it was exterior light, didn't seem quite real because the extras were moving a certain way. Right. The people behind the background were sort of walking, kind of acting walking. They weren't really walking. Exactly. They were like acting that they were walking. And I said, this is. There were never grid streets either, if you remember. No, 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 there was, was no. There was always a curved street. Always a curved street, yeah. Right. And I wondered why. I said, well, this can't be New York. I mean, I was seven years old, but I knew then it couldn't be New York. And we come out, and I come out on 2nd Avenue and 6th Street and see the, the real city. And, uh, uh, and so I, I began to, um, uh, once the film started really shooting in New York in the late 40s, early 50s, like Naked City and even Kiss of Death and sure. things like that. Uh, and eventually, as we say, the really, really hit home and on the waterfront for us, the Lower East Side. Uh, uh, once I saw that, I realized it was changing. And I wanted very much to, um, to uh, uh, recreate that love I had for, uh, for those films and the warmth I felt towards them because they were fooling us. They yes. were fooling us, but it was just an impression. 
you know? So if you notice, notice the extras too in New York, New York, they're all walking, acting, walking. Right. Or they're yeah. all dancing, acting, dancing. They're not, they really had to be a little specifically off. And they had yeah. to be not quite right, you know? And of course, of course, the car scene in, in, uh, in uh, it was his car actually, the green car. I tried yes. to get that color green. The way the, the old sedan sure. used to be green, and we never quite got the green exactly right. Okay. It was kind of a forest green that I wanted. Uh, painted it four times the car. But that scene is direct homage to the uh, scene where Lana Turner becomes hysterical okay. in Bad and the Beautiful. Yes. Uh, Minnelli. And uh, Minnelli's films I love. And, and uh, the thing about Bad and the Beautiful, um, that scene is actually much more elegant than Bad and the Beautiful. The camera actually moves and sways back and forth. And it's all in one shot, isn't it? That's all in one Yes. No, and I saw that film, I was 1952, I was 10 years old. I'll never forget. Yeah. I also never forget that film because they, I was so fascinated by the films they were making in the film. Right, of course. That's right, yes. <laughs> I wonder that, what those stories that were. That's Russian one. Yeah, well, Russia, yeah, or the doctor arriving in, the, in sort of a western kind yes, of a, right. 1890 film. So, uh, something very strange and very beautiful. And I guess the, the, the trashy um, uh, hysteria of the picture is yes. what caught me too. He says, I, sometimes I like to be cheap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <You know? laughs> caught the picture, Georgia. Thought you were swell. Thought yeah. you were swell, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, that was outrageous. Sure. Outra and what about that incredible, incredible crane shot uh, of the crane itself? Yes, oh, no, at the beginning of, of the film with Barry exactly. Sullivan directing, and the camera comes down, and I wondered what those machines were. I had no idea. Sure. And it just fascinated me, uh, the Jonathan Shields character and all of that. But um, mainly, the New York, New York had to do uh, a lot with the musicals, and uh, as I say, a homage to the old films. Then the idea was the films of the 70s. The films of the 70s would then be imprinted or superimposed over that. Almost a documentary of a marriage, let's say. A right. marriage between two creative people. And um, uh, that was the most important. Would they, would they work? I don't know. Uh, because, you see, we didn't only stop. We didn't stop at sets. We went to um, costumes. All the shoulder pads were maybe a quarter of an inch longer. Uh, ties were maybe a quarter of an inch bigger. Collars were bigger. And makeup on the men, too. Makeup on, on lips and everything to try to give that three strip technicolor feeling. We, right. Um, but I felt, I felt after, while I was doing it, I realized that Hollywood, the old Hollywood that I love was really gone. And I always say it's almost like it was like dressing up a corpse. And it's like it had nothing, it had no more life in it that way. And we had to give it a new life. And I was crashing the two forms together. And I don't know how successful it is, but. Uh, um, I did enjoy doing some of the sweeping camera moves and things like that. That was fun. Yeah. I was thinking when you were just talking now about, you know, the way you were sort of putting this le level of improvisation on top of yeah. the sort of old mm -hmm. Hollywood sort of confected style. In terms of directing the actors, um, was this a way that you were used to working with with De Niro, for example, having you know, done Mean Streets together yeah. and, and so yeah. forth? Was this a common part of a working relationship to well, in Mean Streets, in fact, right now on the television, that scene, the most important improvisational scene is on now on TV uh, they have here uh, that we did. It was Bob's idea to do this scene in the back room in Mean Streets, and uh, he improvised on the last day of shooting. And, uh, it was mainly his idea, and I loved it because he really had the character down. He had the character down. And what he did, what he was able to do, what he was able to do was to... Yeah, what he was able to do in this was to really capture, on, capture the quality of life for the Italian American small time hood mm. in New York, on, the Lower East Side. Not, maybe not it, Pleasant it, Avenue, 116th Street, or the, or the other enclaves of Italian Americans, right. but definitely the Lower East Side and some guys we knew as we were growing up. Um, and he was really able to do it. And uh, I felt that anybody could just take this sequence and later on, uh, 40 years from now, look at it and really see how we lived. Just that one little sequence. Yeah. You can see from the whole film, too. I mean, this, this film, Mean Streets, was obviously not The Godfather. It was, it was the real day-to-day -day life of what we had, what we lived through, of course, my friends yeah. and I. And uh, uh, so from the basis of that improvisation, we then, I then did Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, and I worked that way with Ellen Burstyn. And we were able to improvise from Robert Getchell's script, and it was quite, quite good with Getchell, in fact. He would help us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then The Taxi Driver, very little improvisation. Very little improvisation in Taxi Driver. But by the time we got to New York, New York, we played off of that scene you just saw on Mean Streets. We went further. Every scene became like that. But unfortunately, we didn't have any place we were going. We didn't have a stopping point. And so everybody would improvise, would improvise. I, I never forget, I would, get, I would get involved in scenes where people would order food and drinks. And I would shoot ordering uh, drinks for a day and a half, two days sometimes. There's a big scene in the uh, club, the Neon Club, where they order drinks, a pink lady, right. and all that. And, uh, uh, I did other scenes where they were ordering sandwiches, which went on and on. And I thought that ordering food is important for the character. And you would see. But I mean, I just didn't have enough time between, between the singing 
and how long that took. Sure. I couldn't have time to have people ordering food for. In fact, the first cut was four hours and twenty minutes. Yeah. That was probably the best version of it. You know. I was wondering because you were anyway, talking about <clears throat> working with improvisation with actors and and the, and the fact you've done it with some other actors as well. What is bad acting as far as you're concerned? I mean, in other words, there's a, a, a real collaboration between you and the actors, but what is the point? When you think no, they're 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 being too self-indulgent as actors, or no, that I, I this is you not. You know, I can never tell if they're being self-indulgent uh, too much. Um, I mean, I guess I could, but I, I I guess what for me the hardest thing is to get some uh, an actor, another actor, one actor to talk to the other actor. Basically, it's, for me, acting is you know, just sit down the way we're talking. And now, as even I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm I don't normally talk to you this way because I know we're being photographed, exactly. and I'm talking a little lecturing almost to a, to an audience out there. Right. But because I know we have to make a certain amount of time, uh, points in ten minutes of magazine time, and it's a little hard. But I find that I find that that if I just don't, my ear tells me. But I could I could a lot of the scenes in Mean Streets I didn't even look at. I was hiding behind bars and stuff. I could tell from the earphones if the scene was acting, if right. the acting was going well. I could tell by the tones in their voices, and that's it. Just my ear, uh, just my ear for dialogue, and that's why I say it might be very difficult for me to do a picture of the same France, or because I have to know more of the idiom, the people, the way they speak. Italy, maybe not, but, mm. but France. Well, well, that brings up a question I had on uh, Last Temptation of Christ. That you know, we're talking about an ear, but, yeah. but, but there you are, Last Temptation of Christ, doing a story. Well, it's tricky. Of, well, exactly. <laughs> with American actors, or most Very American, tricky. and you're dealing with biblical times. How, how does your ear come in on that? Just, we, just, we just did, you take, take the assumption that um, basic, plain American speech, plain American speech, not, not exalted British speech, right. not plain British speech, but plain American speech, um, had to sound good to my ears that I could believe them with slight regional variations like New York, uh, 